But we begin tonight with a message for Republicans. And I don't know who needs to hear this in the Republican Party since y'all keep trying, even though voters keep telling you over and over and over again. But abortion is a big problem for you. That should be the message Republicans take away from Tuesday's big night for Democrats, as voters sent a resounding message that no matter what Sam Alito and his fellow commanders of Gilead want, stripping half the population of control of their own bodies and reproductive decisions is a massive loser for Republicans. And when voters get the chance to vote to protect that basic right, they're going to do it, whether their state is blue, purple or red. Abortion rights were the driving issue in elections up and down Tuesday's ballots. Let's start with Virginia. Voters there rejected Republican Governor Glenn Youngkin's genius plan to prime America for a, quote, reasonable national abortion ban. Democrats blocked the Republican takeover of state government, retaining control of the state Senate and flipping control of the Virginia House of Delegates. That will put an end to Glenn Youngkin's plans for a 15-week abortion ban in Virginia and to Republican big-money donors' fever dream that the vest-wearing, book-banning finance guy will rescue the party, beat Trump in a late primary, and glide into the White House having cracked the abortion ban cheat code. It was a hard no for Virginia last night. Meanwhile, in deep red Kentucky, abortion was also at the forefront. Incumbent Democratic Governor Andy Bashir mollywhopped State Attorney General Daniel Cameron, defeating him by five points in a state Donald Trump won by 26 points in 2020. Cameron is best known outside of Kentucky for refusing to seek justice against the police officers who killed Breonna Taylor. Kentucky voters rejected him in part because of his support for Kentucky's sweeping abortion ban. But Governor Bashir also bucked the national media narrative that the Democratic Party is in trouble following some disappointing polling numbers for President Biden this week. Kentucky voters also rejected Republican efforts to weaponize the culture wars, rejecting anti-transgender attacks on Governor Bashir, who'd voted, who'd vetoed a pair of anti-trans bills in the state. Those attacks also failed in Virginia, where revo voters also made history electing the state's first transgender state senator, Danica Rome, one of several historic firsts last night. Sherelle Parker was elected the first woman mayor of Philadelphia. Rhode Island elected its first black U.S. representative, Gabe Amo. And in New York City, Dr. Yusuf Salam, one of the exonerated five, won a seat on the city council. And while it was almost all good news for Democrats, in Mississippi, Democrat Brandon Presley, a distant cousin of Elvis, narrowly lost to incumbent Governor Tate Reeves amid voting problems. Polling places ran out of ballots in, surprise, surprise, largely black communities in Mississippi's largest county encompassing, encompassing the capital, Jackson. You know, where the water stopped working properly earlier this year and where the nearly all white state leadership seized control of the police. Perhaps the most resounding victory for abortion rights came in another red state, Ohio, which had a direct abortion question on the ballot. Voters there overwhelmingly said yes to enshrining abortion rights in their state constitution by 14 points. And yet, despite that raft of evidence that abortion is a losing issue for Republicans everywhere, some of them still seem to be not getting the message. Daniel Cameron was a rising star in the Republican Party until he decided to throw his lot in with Donald Trump. I mean, let's face it, Donald Trump is political and electoral poison down ballot. Democrats right. are trying to scare women into thinking Republicans right. don't want abortion legal under any circumstances. What a uh, an epic failure by Governor Youngkin. This is a huge loss. You put very sexy things like abortion and marijuana on the ballot and a lot of young people come out and vote. It, 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 was, a, it was a secret sauce for disaster in Ohio. Thank goodness that most of the states in this country don't allow you to put everything on the ballot because right. pure democracies are not the way to run a country. So huh. We have a very distinguished panel to discuss all of this. Former Senator Claire McCaskill, David Plouffe, former Obama campaign manager, Charlie Sykes, editor at large of The Bulwark, and Jason Johnson, professor of politics and journalism at Morgan State University. Claire, I'm going to start with you with this, get through some of these polls. I mean, very sexy things like abortion. Yeah. Sexy. You know, and, and this is from a guy who has been a radical on this subject, Santorum, forever. Yeah. 
And he, what he's basically saying is, we do not agree with the majority of America, so therefore we must keep the majority of America from speaking yeah. on this topic. Yeah. Uh, Democracy is a bad thing, per the, centaur. The, with, with, the, with Roe being overturned, this discussion changed from a theoretical to real for women in America. Yeah. And anybody, I read this morning in the Wall Street Journal, some political genius out of Virginia, Republican consultant, said, well, this won't be that big of an issue next year. <laughs> I got a news flash for you. This issue is not going away. Yeah. The women of this country and many of the men do not like their freedom being taken away, do not want the government in this very personal, delicate, difficult situation. They don't want the government there. And they're going to vote that way. And it's going to be a big winner for the Democrats next year. And, and the thing is, you know, David Plouffe, it's not just a big winner among Democrats. It's a big winner in Republican states, in red states, in Ohio. Let me just read you some of these uh, exit polls in Ohio. NBC exit polls, Ohio women 18 to 44, 74 percent voted to enshrine abortion in the Constitution. Ohio women over 45, it's less, but it's still 52 percent, no 48. Go down to, uh, by education. These are white voters in Ohio. I, I think only about 7% of the electorate was black. So white voters were the vast majority. White women college graduates, 63%, yes. White women non-college graduates were the ones who were 50-50. White male college graduates, 57%, yes. It's really only white men without college degrees that were in the 40s. Everyone else was in the 50s or above. Last thing I will read to you from Ohio voters. How do you feel about the Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade? The largest percentage in the pluralities was angry. 38 percent, 22 percent dissatisfied. David Pluff, I, I don't know how much more data Republicans would need to understand that the American people in the majority do not want women's bodies controlled by the state. I don't understand what else to tell them. Uh, do you? Well, and I just want to underscore what Claire said. I think uh, Republicans will try and run away from this issue, but there's no running away from it. The American people believe this is one of the most important issues. they are proven they're going to vote on it. And if Trump is on the top of the ticket, Roe v. Wade was overturned largely because the Supreme Court justices that he nominated. You know, he owns this. He's kind of the godfather of uh, the decision uh, that overturned Roe v. Wade. I will say this, uh, obviously a great result for Democrats. We should celebrate that. We have a lot of history now going back to 22 that this issue drives. But like in Ohio, that was an election just on abortion. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think Democrats now, sadly, wasn't too long ago that we were competitive in Ohio and hopefully Sherrod Brown can hold into a seat. Um, and I think he will. But, you know, we lose a lot of races in that state by 10 points. So uh, the nerd in me thinks as you look at these races, whether it's Kentucky, which was a straight up candidate race, Ohio, the Virginia legislative races, there's a whole bunch of voters there that voted the Democratic side or progressive side that currently aren't saying they're going to vote for Joe Biden or the Democratic candidates. That is a data and research gold one, you know, to know who they are and, and what you can do to close the sale. The other thing I'd say is, um, you know, Democrats, and this wasn't always the case for most of my career, quite frankly, but do perform really well now in lower turnout elections. Mm -hmm. We know if Trump's on top of the ticket, his turnout's coming next year. And so that's going to be the challenge is we have to not just do what we need to do with swing voters. And I think abortion can play a big role in that. But we also have to do what we need to do on turnout. And I think that's the biggest, biggest concern. We've got plenty of time to address it. Uh, but but that's if, if things don't go like we'd like to next November, I think that's going to be the factor. And, and well, let me let me go to you on this, uh, Jason, because that's a good point. One of the things that Democrats do have a can have a, an advantage over Republicans uh, is candidate quality. <laughs> let's just let's just I mean, Andy Bashir yeah. is he comes from a one of the, you know, it's probably the gold ticket name surname to have in the state of Kentucky. His father was governor, very popular. And the other piece of it is it proves that the things you deliver actually matter. Maintaining Obamacare, which they call Connect, which they very wisely didn't call Obamacare. And, and it's popular. And when his predecessor tried to get rid of it, that is how Andy Bashir beat him the first time. That's how he became governor, was beating the guy who tried to take away Kentuckians health care. So candidate quality matters. Right. But talk about that from the Bashir angle, but also in the Youngkin angle for, for Republicans. They saw him as their high quality candidate. But he made that election about abortion. He chose to do that. He said, if I get if I get the right. majority in these two houses, I'm banning abortion. 
there, there's so much to unpack here, Joy. Here's the thing. First off, when it comes to Andy Bashir, he did a good job. He is the second most popular governor in America, besides the governor of Hawaii. Like, he was a very, very popular guy. But this is an extremely red state. So it's not just that he did a good job, but he was running against Daniel Cameron, who arguably is the most loathed candidate amongst <laughs> black people since the first time Donald Trump ran. I cannot stress this enough. I talked to plenty of people in Kentucky. That man has the blood of Breonna Taylor's hands. He, he, her blood is on his hands. And people remembered that. And black voters remembered that. And Daniel Cameron couldn't run away from that. So Andy Bashir, by focusing on, hey, I've done a good job, and running against someone who is seen as the lowest of the low by most black voters was a good combination. As far as Glenn Youngkin goes, you hear that sound? You hear that beeping? That, that's the truck. That's the bandwagon for Glenn Youngkin backing up away from Iowa and every other place. Okay, Glenn Youngkin was looking too far ahead. He was like, I'm going to win these elections. I'm going to be the reverse DeRay. I'm the guy in the vest. I play basketball <laughs> in my front yard. I'm your cul-de-sac South Park Republican, and I'm going to be able to slide into the presidency. First off, no one is going to move ahead in the Republican Party until Donald Trump is gone. And second, you can't keep hiding what stinks. You can throw on all the cologne you can want. You can put on all the nice candidates that you want. Abortion is a dead issue for Republicans. People don't like it, and Young can learn that lesson, but the rest of the party isn't going to figure it out. Yeah. Thousands of Palestinians continue to flee northern Gaza as Israeli troops push into the heart of Gaza City. And the UN and Red Cross continue warning of a, human, a humanitarian catastrophe. While here in the U.S., the House of Representatives, which I should note has still not passed a budget to avoid a government shutdown, took time out of its schedule yesterday to censure Democratic Representative Rashida Tlaib, the sole Palestinian-American in Congress, over her rhetoric about the war between Israel and Hamas. Twenty-two Democrats joined most Republicans in the rebuke, accusing her of calling for the destruction of Israel for her use of the slogan, from the river to the sea. The censure, however, did not come before heated debate on the House floor. Rashida Tlaib has the right to spew anti-Semitic vitriol and even call for the destruction of the Jewish state. But the House of Representatives also has the right to make it clear that her hate speech does not reflect the opinion of the chamber. What is true here is that every single one of them has not acknowledged the fact that Palestinians are dying in the tens of thousands, but will continue to say it is us who are not acknowledging humanity. You had a member of your time party expired. call my colleague a terrorist, and you didn't censor her. Palestinian people are not disposable. We are human beings. Just like anyone else, the cries of the Palestinian and, ch Palestinian and Israeli children sound no different to me. Why, what I don't understand is why the cries of Palestinians sound different to you all. Joining me now is Democratic Congressman Brad Schneider of Illinois, who voted in favor of censuring Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib. Uh, and I'm sure you were able to hear, I know that you probably can't see it, but you could hear, and I'm sure you were hearing uh, what uh, Congresswoman Tlaib had to say yesterday. Uh, tell me why you voted to censure her. Well, thank you for having me. Sure. The, the, issue, the issue is that uh, the phrase, from the river to the sea, has a long history. It was initial... Initially, the cry of the PLO in 1964. Mind you, the PLO in 1964, before Israel took control of Gaza or the West Bank. It is the rallying cry of Hamas, and it has a very distinct meaning. It is the meaning of the destruction of Israel and the murder of the Jews living in Israel. And so that's why it is a fraught, a fraught phrase which ha carries heavy weight. And I think the important thing to recognize is that as elected officials, we all have a responsibility to express our, our feelings, express our views, and have the right to do so. But we also have a responsibility to measure our words, to reserve judgments, and to correct them when we misspeak or, or, or say things. Representative Tlaib has put up on her social media the, the lie about an attack on, on the hospital in Gaza that was not uh, an attack by Israel, but was an errant rocket from Palestinian Islamic Jihad. We asked her to t I asked her to take it on, down. She still has not. And when she uses the term from the river to the sea, 
people know what that means. They know that Hamas, when they crossed the border on October 7th, just brutally murdered 1,400 people, took 240 civilians hostage back to, to Gaza, continues to hold those hostages today and continues to fire rockets at Israeli cities from Palestinian neighborhoods in Gaza. When they say from the river to the sea, it has a very specific meaning, and that meaning, meaning needed to be called out. Well, let me ask you this question, because this phrase has had many meetings over the many years, um, and it has been used in ways that I think could be arguably... Um, negative toward Israel or wanting Israel not to exist anymore. But not everyone agrees that that's what it is. Uh, are you aware that the Likud party, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's party, used in its original party platform between the sea and the Jordan, there will be only Israeli sovereignty? So others have used the phrase as well. Um, and are just as wrong. And it's, it's you know, the, I'm, I'm the, one of the founders and co-chairs of the Abraham Accords Caucus uh, in Congress, bipartisan, bicameral. And the idea of the Abraham Accords, the normalization of relations between Israel and Arab states, is that Jews and Arabs belong to the same land. Both have legitimate claims to that land, and both need to learn how to live on that land. And the Abraham Accords recognizes Israel, but also recognizes that by embracing each other, Arabs and Jews together can not only lift up the land, but can lift up each other, the people of the region, and give all their kids the future and prosperity that they deserve. Let me uh, read to you what Rashida Tlaib, her explanation of her use of the slogan. This is what she said. From the river to the sea is an aspirational call for freedom, human rights, and peaceful coexistence, not death, destruction, or hate. My work in advocacy is always centered in justice and dignity for all people, no matter faith or ethnicity. Did you have a conversation with your Democratic colleague um, before making the decision? on how to vote on this? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, not questioning, I'm not questioning her intentions, her good intentions. I believe that she wants for the Palestinians the peace that she, she talks about and promotes. But the fact of the matter is that Hamas uses from the river to sea as their rally and cry. People around the world have heard that, have joined that, and have called but for the destruction my, of the state of my Israel. My question to you, though, is did you talk to her? Did you have a personal one-on-one -on -one conversation with her? She hasn't talked to me in over a year. Um, let me ask you this question. Are you concerned about the optics of while 10,000 people um, have reportedly been killed in Gaza and 4,000 of them children, and while people are still dying, and the fact that she has family in the West Bank where settler violence is continuing, that she's been censured. When I'm going to just put up a tweet by Mehdi Hassan, by my colleague Mehdi Hassan, about some of the things that others have said in the House. Republican Congressman Max Miller said Gaza should be turned into a parking lot. Republican Congressman Brian Mast said Palestinian civilians are like Nazis. Republican Senators Lindsey Graham and Tom Cotton said Gaza should be leveled and, the, and to bounce the rubble. None of those people have been censured. Would you call upon those people to be censured? And are you concerned about the optics of just censuring the one Palestinian American member? Look, I, I have a, a, a long record. I called out Paul, Paul Gosar when he threatened uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I called out Marjorie Taylor Greene when she made inappropriate uh, analogies to the Holocaust. Uh, when Brian Mass on the floor last week, uh, when we were debating various bills, uh, made the statements or similar statements to what you just described about the Palestinians, I called him out on it. We have to see the humanity on all sides. And it, it's, it's, not, it's not just the optics of 10,000 people, uh, people dying in Gaza. In war, the civilians are always the victims. They're caught in the middle. Hamas started this war on October 7th with a horrific, heinous attack, killing 1,400 Israelis, murdering and raping those Israelis. They took 240 prisoners hostage that they will not allow the International Red Cross to visit or provide them the medical care that they need. We need to come together and talk to each other and find a way to promote peace. But as long as Hamas controls Gaza, as long as Hamas is threatening to destroy Israel and calling for the genocide of the Jewish people, there can't be peace what for Israel I, yeah. or Palestine. And what, but what I asked you about was not the obviously the you know ten thousand people and four thousand children dying is not optics. I meant the optics of censuring the only Palestinian American member of the United States House of Representatives. Very briefly, it, we're it, out of time. It, it, yeah, it's, it's not a question of who; it's a question of the words. And the, the statement mm -hmm. from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, is a call for the destruction of Israel and the genocide of the Jewish people. I and I will call out any time. And I will note that she does not. Uh, agree with that and that she is not I, embraced I understand. that. Okay. Well, I I'm understand that. Mm -hmm. Right. Congressman I, Brad Schneider, I'm so sorry. We're out of time. I wish we had more time. Okay. Thank you so sure much. Thing.